Thank you so much. Um, good evening, uh, good afternoon, uh, whatever we're in multiple time zones right now. Um, so today we're going to discuss how to migrate from a MongoDB replica set to a sharded cluster. Uh, we got inspired by this idea because most of our customers start from a replica set and at some point of uh, uh, their application lifecycle, they want to move to a sharded cluster. And this is a slide about us. Uh, I think Emily already uh, uh, made the introductions. Um, <clears throat> we're both members of Fragspace since 2014. We, we work for, for the Object Rocket uh, team. Uh, we offer a database as a service and uh, we have on our portfolio various databases like MongoDB, Elastic, uh, Postgres, etc. Um, we both love Mongo uh, on our own different way. So a little bit of what we're gonna to discuss today. We're gonna to give you some definitions of uh, what's a replica set and a sharded cluster uh, to begin. And uh, then we're gonna present you the reasons to migrate. Um, if you don't know how, why you want to migrate, there's no point um, going through all this process. And then we're gonna talk about the actual uh, migration, which has been divided in three parts. It's the pre-flight, prepare, uh, the actual migration, uh, and the post-flight, which we're actually entering the sharding era. And in the end, we're gonna talk a little bit about scaling because this is pretty much why people are migrating from replica sets to sharded clusters. And hopefully we'll have some time for Q&A. So what is a replica set? Um, a replica set is a group of MongoD processes that maintain the same data set. Um, pretty much you're using uh, a replica set for redundancy and high availability. So in case one of your nodes goes down, you have another two or four or five, whatever uh, size of your replica set. Um, those replica sets can scale um, only vertically when talking about the nodes. Uh, and obviously you can add more secondaries at some point if you want to support more reads, but your writes are gonna go to the primary. So the only way to grow is vertically. A shard cluster is a group of those replica sets that are accessible through a Mongo S, one or many. Uh, the Mongo S is offering an abstraction layer on top of all these replica sets because your driver would be get, con get confused to access them all. So you need an abstraction layer that's gonna unify all these MongoD processes and present them to the driver as uh, one entity. So this is the standard way of MongoDB, MongoDB, uh, of MongoDB to scale horizontally. So if you want to scale your rights, that's the best way to do it. So why migrate? Um, in this section, we're gonna see uh, first, if you, if you make the right choice, right? If you have to first think why I want to migrate from a replica set that probably works fine to a solid cluster. And then if you take that choice, you have to convince some people on your team. So you're gonna find the next slides useful to do so. So nine out of 10, uh, of our customers are moving from a replica set to a shadow cluster because they need to scale their cluster better. On a replica set, as we said before, we can only scale vertically. And by that, I mean for the writes. The writes are going to the primary. There's only one primary on a replica set. So if you want to support more writes, the only option that you have is to get a bigger box. At some point, um, those boxes might become too big, too expensive, and most probably you're gonna start seeing that the more you increase in that box, the performance you're getting is not uh, on the same scale that it was in the very beginning. For example, if you go from two gigs of RAM to four gigs of RAM, you might see 10 times better performance. But if you go from 32 gigs of RAM to 64, you might see 1.2 X performance. And this is a test I want to share here that we did with a container we run the container with 32 gigs of RAM and 64 gigs of RAM and you see that, okay, it performed a little bit better, but it didn't actually worth it to bump the RAM. Now on sharded clusters, we divide our data to multiple Mongo uh, D uh, servers, right? Multiple replica sets. So each replica set runs a subset of our workload. So our inserts are get evenly distributed, hopefully if you pick the right shard key, so adding more and more of these shards is gonna increase the throughput of our cluster. So 
if you're using only operations with a shard key, that's going to be close to linear. If you're not, if you're using like kind of like a mixed workload, both shard key uh, and non shard key operations, it's not going to go again close to, to linear. It's going to get more logarithmic, but it's going to be way better the curve than uh, the one we saw before with uh, the replica set. And on the replica sets, all the connections go to the primary when it comes to writes. And imagine that on a big environment, uh, the primary might get thousands of connections. So that causes some issues to the primary. It doesn't only have to uh, manage the actual workload, but it also needs to manage the, all these connections, the TCP layer. Uh, on shuttle cluster, we have the Mongo S's that it's the point that your driver actually connects and they can handle the connection from your driver. So if you have 1,000 connections, you have 10 Mongo S, each one will get 100. So you can scale your connections as well. Another very common scenario is you, if you have distributed clusters uh, uh, among dif different regions. If you're using a replica set here, uh, you might have one primary in the US and, all of the, uh, and scatter the, your secondaries around the globe. So if you have a customer somewhere in Asia, it will go and request a read from the closest secondary uh, but when he needs to write something, he needs to go to the US. And obviously that write that he will do, do he, he will have to go back to uh, the region that he is in order to read it back. So that gets you some latency. Now on a sharded cluster, you can have one shard on each region. So your customer now will write and read from the same region. So it's gonna be way faster. You're gonna get the latency out of that. On this slide, uh, it's, uh, we present the hot cold partition architecture, which is the same as the geographical distributed uh, clusters. Just instead of geographic areas, just put a hot and cold storage and you do exactly the same thing. It's a, it's a cool way to archive your data. You just change the tag on your data and they go automatically to the cold storage. So it's the same use case. Uh, workload isolation. If you have a replica set and you have two databases, for example, uh, if you want to isolate them to, to create two different instances for, for that uh, workload, you need two replica sets. And this is how your driver is going to work. You need to create a connection on both. If you have a sharded cluster, because the Mongo S provides that abstraction layer that we discussed before, you can have them both under the same Mongo S or Mongo S's, right? So nothing changed on your driver. So you can isolate your databases and your developers won't feel a thing. Also, uh, if you have uh, small servers, that might decrease your costs and the manageability becomes much, much more easier. Imagine if you have one terabyte of data and you need to build an index, it might take a couple of hours. If you have distributed uh, those across 50 shards and each shard holds 20 gigs of data, it's gonna take a couple of minutes if you have a tool to run all these indexes at the same time. Also, initial sync will be faster. If you do initial sync on one terabyte, it's gonna be a nightmare and backup and restore at the same, it's the same. Now, you have decided that you're gonna do the migration, right? We convinced you with all of our slides and now you have to prepare, all right? So the first thing that you need to do is to create the additional infrastructure and that includes config servers and Mongo S's. The config servers are lightweight processes. They don't need much of, uh, uh, CPUs or RAM or high-speed storage. Um, I would say start with something low, like four gigs of RAM and two to four uh, virtual CPUs. Um, and they run as a replica set. So on the left, uh, you can see the configuration file uh, that we created for uh, config server. Um, the most important, I think, is to, is to, to add the role uh, under the sharding. I have a, a red arrow there that says sharding plus the role config SRV. Uh, if you don't do that, uh, MongoDB won't understand that this is a replica set that meant to be for config servers. And also use file when you getting familiar with a new service in, because it's easier to uh, increase the verbosity rather than using the system log, which is better for later on that the service is going to be more mature. And when you kick the config servers, when you do the RS initiate on these three services, uh, make sure you include on the definition the config uh, server equals true. And you can see that on the picture on the bottom. Mongo S services, again, lightweight processes. They don't need a lot of RAM or CPU. Uh, it's recommended to have at least two 
Three is better. Uh, try to run them on different hardware. You can run multiple Mongo S's on the same hardware, that's fine. But at least have some separate hosts that they're gonna keep something like zones for your Mongo S's in order to have high availability. Don't put all the Mongo S's in one server, even if it can handle those. Uh, they don't require disk. They require disk only for logging. They don't keep any data locally. Now the RAM CPU depends on the use case. If you have an application that opens and close connections very rapidly, you might need some CPU. Uh, if you have a workload that does a lot of uh, data fetches and has to merge them, you might need a lot of RAM. So this is something that you need to test. There's no uh, magic recipe there. Um, the good news is that you can have as many as you want. So you can, you can scale them. If you see that they cannot handle the workload, you can add more. That's fine. Um, the only thing that you need to give to the configuration, and that's the red arrow on the left, is the config server replica set, the one that you prepared from before. This is because the config servers keep your cluster metadata and the Mongo S needs to know where each piece of data resides. And using that connection string, you're gonna read the metadata and direct your driver accordingly. You have to create a user. It's the same thing as you do on, on the replica set. I'm not gonna stay on that slide for long. And now you have a shell. You have two empty databases, congratulations. And as you can see, the, the admin database is similar to the one that you have on the replica set, while the config database has kind of like more collections and uh, Jason is gonna talk about those on the next uh, section and their mission. You have to configure networking. Um, the cluster must be able to communicate. So the new servers that you're gonna create the config in the Mongo S must communicate with the shards. So you need to have those, you have rules in place to have all these ports open. Um, post transition, when you finish your migration, uh, your driver must only have access to the Mongo S. So any rules that uh, were created to give access to the driver to the Mongo Ds should be removed. Authentication authorization. Um, everything now is gonna be handled by the Mongo S when it comes to authentication. So you have to copy all of your users from the replica set to the Mongo S, right? Um, you can create them from scratch if you have very few, and that's a good way to clean up. Uh, you can do a Mongo import and export of the users and role collection from the replica set to, uh, towards the Mongo S, or you can use the following script that will do the same job and just connect and copy the users from the Mongo D to the Mongo S. Um, you can manipulate those queries and do filtering like to like per department or uh, do a prefix on the users, whatever. The connection string, um, you have to test it, right? You have your Mongo S, use your driver to test that those connection strings are actually can connect, your driver can actually connect to those. The reason here is you're using multiple parameters on your replica set. Most of, all of them, I think they're compatible, but things changing between versions, so make sure that this connection string with the same parameters is compatible. Now, there's a big difference between the connection string on a replica set that you only have to give one node and the driver will find the topology. Here, you have to give all the Mongo S's that you want the driver to access. So if you have 100 Mongo S's, that might be a long connection string. And you have to do some changes on your replica set. You have to go to each node configuration and add that sharding cluster all equals equals to shard server. And then you have to do a rolling restart. Stop a secondary, start the secondary, uh, then the other secondary, then all the secondaries, and then step down in the X primary. If you don't do that, when you run the add shard command, which actually initiates the cluster, you'll get the following exception. So you have to do it afterwards. Don't leave unfinished items. This is a good advice for every type of transition you're, that you're doing. So if you had leftover items from previous, upgrades or um, something, um, finish that, right? So out schema upgrades, if you are before 4.0, we see that very frequently or set feature compatibility version, um, take them to the end. Prepare your midware, middleware. So uh, you have to monitor that tier, you have to start taking backups. Um, on the config servers, you have to get prepared uh, to get the data directory and the config file for the Mongo S, only the config file is fine. So just make sure you have that on your report, your deployment scripts, uh, but prepare your middleware to be able to connect 
And finally, inspect your codes. Uh, if you're in 4.0 and, and higher, there are only two uh, commands that are incompatible when you transition, and those are very rare uh, to use in your code, especially the geo search. I've never seen that in my life. They were sometimes. Um, if you're before the 4.0, there's a long list, um, <clears throat> but most of these commands are already deprecated. So if you're following the good practice, you don't have it on your code. So always sacrifice the dev, QA, and UAT instances first. If something happens, it needs to happen with those instances. And don't be one of these guys that have its production to a sharded cluster and the QA, dev, UAT in replica set. Those two are incompatible. If you do a change on a replica set, you never know if it's going to be compatible in a sharded cluster. All right. <clears throat> now with all the pre-flight uh, requirements complete, it's time to migrate. So to migrate, the first thing we need to do is add a shard. The prerequisites, as Antonio mentioned, are already complete. We have a healthy Mongo S tier. We have, that, we have a health, healthy config tier, and we know we have a, a healthy shard or replica set to add uh, because production is currently using that. So what do we do? Uh, the first, the, what we need to do is add the shard. Uh, what you see here is the shard name, uh, followed by at least one member of the replica set uh, to add that to the Mongo S tier. If you wanted to be more thorough, you could have the whole, uh, you could have all members listed here, but a minimum of one is required. And what does this do? Uh, the first thing it does is it should give you a resolve back um, confirming that the, the shard has been added. Next, just like your driver, it's gonna open up a replica set monitor connection uh, to, the, to the replica set uh, uh, to monitor for um, state changes, health, and also um, internal commands and operations. Next, you're gonna see config.shards be populated with this information. Now, one thing to note here, if your replica set and now shard contained hidden members, you will not see those populated here. The Mongo S is only gonna track members that are visible, um, that were visible and still visible. Next, when you run that command, <clears throat> it will populate, it'll scan the, the shard for all databases that were present and then populate the config databases collection uh, for the metadata. Now this command and only an, a write to the, the shard or the replica set triggers the population of this. So if you ever got into a situation where one is not present here, uh, use that database, write to a test collection and that will force this to be populated but by default, the add chart command will populate that. Uh, next, when you had uh, initialized your, your shell tier, your Mongo S tier, you may, seen, you may have seen events about the system sessions collection. Uh, once a shard has been added, which is the persistent data layer uh, for, <clears throat> for your sharded cluster, the config system sessions now can be set up. So after about 60, 60 seconds, you should see a message similar to this in your log um, that it was set up, sharded, and now being stored at the MongoD layer. And now it's time to test. Um, before, you want, before you plan to point any of your services to the MongoS layer, you wanna run sanity checks. You wanna uh, make sure that uh, server status and, or sorry, um, cluster status from the, the MongoS reports to shards reports to databases and all Mongo S's that you currently have present and configured. Next, you're gonna to wanna to go to your data and run finds or aggregations to confirm that you can retrieve data. And then it's also recommended to write to a test collection. All these operations would trigger exceptions or errors for intra-cluster communication if something was not configured properly. Now uh, for the actual migration, as Antonio has mentioned, this is where you deploy a new URI and at a minimum, you need to make these changes. First, you, you swap in the Mongo S <clears throat> nodes, um, multiple for redundancy. Um, depending on how many Mongo S nodes that you have, you could use a subset, um, but in this case, we're just passing all that are available. And then also removing the replica set parameter uh, from the URI. If the replica set parameter is passed to a Mongo S, um, it will not know that parameter and result in exception. So here we're gonna go over how you would deploy your application and minimize the risk as part of that. Uh, first, we're gonna identify 
uh, a subset, say 25% of each of your services and schedule them for a deploy to the Mongo S layer. You're gonna wanna have ready application logs because at default verbosity, the application logs will typically give you more information um, in a problem scenario. Um, next, the Mongo S logs, monitor those for potential exceptions or authentication errors or inter-cluster inter issues. Um, and next, the resources, uh, specifically CPU and connection counts when it comes to transitioning a workload to the Mongo S. These are uh, two of the main issues we've seen when, tran when transitioning from a, a replica set to a Mongo S tier. Um, highly recommend Percona's um, management software and monitoring software, PMM2. And if you're an enterprise MongoDB customer, you could leverage Ops Manager. So with that 25%, um, you take a health check of uh, your transition to the Mongo S tier. So if you're not receiving any exceptions from any of your services, start transitioning a little bit more work to that Mongo S tier and monitoring the previously mentioned metrics as you're doing so. And at that point, because you're doing this gracefully, you shouldn't be encountering any, any cursor errors or any connection errors or leftover connections to your sharding layer because you're doing it in a graceful manner. Once you've migrated 100% of your workload to the Mongo S, continue to monitor and look for any potential issues, whether it be operations, performance, throughput, or scale. In some scenarios, you may have to do a partial or full rollback. Um, in this case, it could be a number of things. It could have been uh, something wasn't compatible from your application to the Mongo S perspective, which should have been identified in queue error staging, or you may have run into throughput or concurrency issues at the Mongo S layer. Because your replica set is still available and exposed, uh, you can transition partial or full rollback to that tier. Um, in the event you encountered, say, like throughput or Mongo S scalability issues, unless it's, unless it's just a too few virtual CPUs or not enough RAM, the recommendation here is to scale this Mongo S tier horizontally. By scaling it horizontally, it gives you the added compute power and the redundancy um, that vertical scaling uh, can't give you. And then to take that one step further, um, you may find that you need to do logical pooling of your Mongo S servers. Uh, you may choose to take half of them, give them to some services, and then take another half and give them to other services. By nature, the, the driver will be health checking all the Mongo S servers, so you need to take that in account, and it's also why the logical pooling makes sense. Next, you're gonna wanna test resiliency. Um, because you were on a replica set, you're familiar with step downs. Uh, your driver should have been configured to handle them gracefully, auto reconnect and continue operations as normal. But now you now step downs are behind um, a query routing layer. So you're gonna wanna test them again and see how your application uh, behaves when that happens. Also, you'll, you'll wanna test unplanned maintenances, um, OOMs or segmentation faults, uh, anything that could just make, especially in the cloud, anything that can make a component go away you're gonna to wanna to test. Uh, also, uh, now that you have a config server tier, uh, having a config server down or even a more extreme circumstance where you lose two config servers and your cluster goes into a read-only state. Everything is still operational at this point, except for sharding operations that need to modify metadata or store metadata or store, um, for example, add user storing data in that configuration tier. Uh, and then to take that further, um, test more extreme scenarios, potentially network issues or a network blip, or what happens if you lost half of your Mongo S's. You know, do you still have enough redundancy and throughput to continue with your production workload? Connection management's also important when switching to a sharded cluster. Um, previously, you were accustomed to just one layer of connection, connection pools and cursor management and driver settings. Now you have to take into account another layer. Uh, this layer sometimes can require tuning um, to get the desired throughput or um, prevent things like cursor timeouts. Um, you're gonna wanna do this via set parameter. Uh, and an example here is you may, you may find that you need to keep a number, a minimum number of connections open. 
from your Mongo S uh, to your Mongo Ds because sometimes connection creation during um, uh, heavy workloads can be very costly. You won't see poor execution times at the Mongo D um, from your queries, but all of a sudden you're getting these, you know, one second, two second latencies in the round trip, and you're not sure why. Sometimes that could come from the Mongo S tier. Uh, so use set parameter as needed and tune those settings appropriately. So now we're in the sharding era. Um, so what do we do now? Um, post flight, repeatable deploys. Um, you know, going forward, you may need to scale or geographically distribute your configuration uh, tier. Uh, so be able to be able to deploy that using your config management as well as scaling up and down your Mongo S tier. You not only have to potentially scale your Mongo D tier. Uh, if you do have geographically distributed nodes that are in different sizes, make sure you have proper op log length, um, you know, uh, for consistent backups if you're not using some type of streaming backup service. Uh, this allows you to get a consistent state across all shards as well as your configuration data. Upgrading and downgrading. You're no longer binary swapping just the MongoD process during upgrades or downgrades. You now have to upgrade other components in the sharded cluster and order matters. Uh, so at times from version to version, the order can change. So it's highly recommended to make sure that you upgrade in proper order and check the documentation for that order for each major version upgrade. And lastly, feature compatibility version. Setting comp feature, compatibility, feature compatibility version in a replica set was just a command to the primary. Now when you do that, the command is actually issued against the Mongo S and you need to then restart the Mongo S here as that propagates to all replica sets in the cluster, including the config layer. And lastly, the metrics for your, Mon your Mongo S tier are not shared. Uh, you still want to monitor and gather metrics individually, but at least through uh, PMM2 or any other Datadog utilities, anything like that, make sure you're ag aggregating um, these metrics across your whole tier so you get a complete view of your, your throughput. Uh, you're going to want to remove anything that may be legacy. And an example here was change or um, monitoring the op log for operations. With a replica set, if you hadn't transitioned to change streams already and you had some legacy code monitoring the op log, switch that to change streams, uh, especially since that's a supported feature uh, from MongoDB. And the reason for that is, is one, it gives you, um, you know, target flexibility. You, you can monitor a collection, a database, or even a deployment. They're resumable. And then since they're based on the aggregation framework, you can also do manipulation um, using the aggregation framework and not having that overhead of doing that in your app or somewhere in your code base or downstream somewhere. Again, it's a supported feature. And most importantly, it, it changes with topology. As your cluster grows um, and you're adding and removing shards, you don't have to um, take that into consideration anymore. The change streams will automatically detect um, any topology changes. And as Antonio has mentioned previously, a single authentication source. If you were still telling the op log, you would have had to maintain uh, authentication at the Mongo S and at the Mongo D layer. Now you can just keep, keep authentication and authorization at the Mongo S. And they are transaction compliant. Uh, chain streams will only give you data that's been majority committed uh, versus telling the op log where you may have ingested some data that has been rolled back. So what, did it, what is it to shard a collection? Uh, so a namespace, which is a database and a collection of MongoDB, um, you, you choose a key for it. And based on that key, and in this case, UUID, the sharding splits that collection up into logical chunks with a min and max range. And then those chunks are then distributed across multiple shards. Um, so to shard properly, the most important thing you can do is understanding your workload. And here uh, we are enabling profiling to gather 100% of our operations uh, so that we can then analyze them. Uh, here in this example, we don't have rate limiting. Um, if you need to do rate limiting due to a degradation of performance, you can pass that with set profiling uh, and then profile for a longer period to make sure you capture all operations. 
And then with that data, whether you're going to use the aggregation framework or a custom script, start generating reports for the namespaces that you want to shard. Uh, most importantly, get a count of the operations um, to understand the scale at which you can distribute them, and then the patterns for those. One, that's going to be your shard key candidates, and two, um, if you for updates and find and modifies, they could potentially break your application. So considerations for candidates um, to, to scale out long term, uh, you want high cardinality, something that's going to give you targeted operations for both read and writes. So when you add shards in the future, those operations get scaled out near literally. Uh, and again, high percentage of the operations from your reports. The closer you can get to 100%, the better scale that you'll have long term. Uh, you typically there is a compromise though uh, that you can scale sometimes just only 90%, and the remaining 10% will have to be broadcasted to all shards. Uh, keep in mind, look for potential hot spots or issues with tiny documents and mediocre cardinality, where it could affect data distribution among various shards. Monotonically increasing fields can impact throughput. Uh, for example, if one of the, the more recent ranges is on a single shard, that single shard will, will receive the new data impacting throughput. A low cardinality and data pruning are also, also um, potential issues, uh, not blockers that will affect you know, data distribution and operation distribution. Um, but with the asterisk there next to low cardinality in MongoDB 4.4, uh, you will have the ability to extend a shard key uh, to improve cardinality if you chose, uh, if you didn't choose right the first time. Some blockers, multiple unique indexes uh, to maintain unique constraints across the cluster. Uh, the, unique, the unique key constraint must be in your shard key. Uh, you do not want null values in your shard keys. Uh, up until 4.2, um, you couldn't modify the, the value for a shard key. Um, but if you are running 4.2, you now have that ability. And again, find a modify. It's a must have to have the shard key in, in your filter pattern. And for updates, um, you, there is one workaround by passing multi-true. In the event you need to revert a shard key, um, you do have some choices. If you're still in a phase where you recently deployed to the Mongo S tier and sharded, but you can still easily cut back to the replica set, um, away from the Mongo S's, you can do so just by re redeploying the previous URI and then removing the sharding rules by connecting to the replica set directly. Um, and then at that point, you would reinit your Mongo S in your config servers and then start over again. Uh, next, you can use the MongoDB um, supported method of Mongo dumping and Mongo restoring the data. Um, by passing the drop command to Mongo restore, drop will remove all, all cluster metadata related to that namespace. And then lastly, if your workload tolerates a brief or no downtime, you do have the option of, of identifying metadata associated to that namespace. Um, and then, you know, combined with removing that metadata uh, and then Mongo S restarts in a step down, uh, remove sharding for that collection. Uh, that's a little bit too complex and too much to go into detail at this time. Okay, um, so as I said in the beginning, nine out of 10 our customers, they do the sharded clusters in order to get scalability, in order to increase their throughput. So let's see what happens when we are in the state that we have defined our shard keys like Jason described before. So all of our collections or some of our collections, the busiest ones are sharded. So as you can see, we're still in one, with one shard. That's your initial replica set. And those green boxes that I have put there are your chunks. The chunks are nothing but logical uh, pieces of your collections, right? So partitions, but logical, not physical. So what you do next, you have to add the shard to scale horizontally, right? It's pretty obvious. So you add the new shard and automatically the cluster will detect that there is an imbalance. There is a process called balancer 
which if it started, which by default I think it is, uh, if it don't, if it doesn't just run SH start balancer, it will detect that imbalance and will start moving those chunks from the one shard to the other. Uh, the balancer is aiming to create a perfect distribution of the chunks. So in this case, we have six chunks. The balancer will aim to move three chunks from the source shard to the destination shard. And that will eventually happen. It will move those chunks over. And the next step for the balancer, not exactly for the balancer, for the cluster, is to remove the leftover data. So it, I move those logical pieces of data. They're not physical, so I cannot just go and wipe a file. Now I have to run a remove command. So I know that I move from key one to key 10. Now those are leaving the new shard and then I have to go and remove them. So there's another process that's called rage deleter that go there and delete those uh, documents. It's gonna do them one at a time, one chunk at a time. And voila, you are, you're having half of your data in one uh, shard, half of your data on the other shard, or if you wanted that rephrased, half of your chunks in one shard, half of your other chunks in the other shard. Now, since this is a fresh sharded collection, most probably um, having the same amount of data is applicable here. If it was something that was after a few days or weeks, most probably those chunks wouldn't have the same size. But since you, you did it like a few hours ago, most probably you're gonna have the same data on both nodes. Um, now, next steps. You want to add more shards. Now, you can take advantage of what we call parallel migrations. Um, if you have, your cluster now has two shards, you can see them on the left, they have three uh, chunks each. If you add one shard, you can utilize only one move of a chunk at a time. So you can have one source and one destination for, for one chunk. So you're gonna get the same uh, speed as you got before that you, you scale from one to two. But if you add two, Mongo has the ability to run parallel migrations. It can, it can choose different source and destination each time, different pairs, and run those migration in parallel. Everything we said before applies to those parallel migrations. It has to do the range deleter and everything. But if, imagine that if you're doubling the size of your cluster, um, it's gonna scale faster. And that's a type, I don't know if the Percona logo is there. Uh, that's a type that uh, it actually can tell you how many parallel migrations you're gonna get uh, based on the number of shards that you have and the number of shards you're gonna add. So uh, if the number of shards you have is bigger than the number of shards you add, then you're gonna get parallel migration equals to the number of the new shards. Else, it's the number of the shards you already have in your cluster. And there are some balancing considerations, right? When you're balancing your data, that doesn't come for free. We said you have to read the data, move them over the network, write them to the other shard, and then delete them. Those are MongoDB operations. They're not something that happens on a, on a file that you just transfer it instantly and you just wipe it after that. It only takes a few milliseconds. So there are ways to make that uh, more graceful, less impactful for your application. Uh, the most I think the most popular one is to define a balancing window. So you say, I want my cluster to balance between midnight and 2 a.m. that I know that the traffic is not significant, right? I don't get any traffic at that time. So let it balance. I don't care if I get the performance penalty. Although uh, you can control the balancing window, you cannot control the range deleter window, right? So range deleter, tasks might kick after the balancing window finishes. You have another option which is called secondary throttle. When the balancer does those moves, it uses read concern of one. It has to only commit it by the primary. That makes it fast, but at the same time, it can, can move a lot of documents at the same time. So the number of inserts that the primary will get might not be able to handle them. So you can use secondary throttle. So for its right now, the source is waiting for majority. So it waits for one secondary at least to acknowledge that. So that makes it a little bit slower, more robust maybe, but slower. So you get less impact. 
And finally, the wait for delete. Now, as we said, range deleter runs asynchronously, right? So you do migrations and at some point the range deleter will kick and do those removes. Now, with wait for delete, you can say, I want to do a migration and then I want to, I want to wait for uh, the range deleter to do the cleanup before I start a new one. Usually the range deleter starts within 10 minutes, but if they're open courses, it might take more than that. But in this way, you do deletes and migrations uh, in a serial fashion. So it's gonna produce less impact for your cluster. Now be aware that the documents are in transit might be visible from the secondaries if you use certain read concerns. Um, also, if something happens during those migrations or before the cleanup happens or in the middle of a cleanup, those documents, it's gonna stay there. They, we call them orphaned documents, actually Mongo called them orphaned documents. So the, the cluster does not log those documents somewhere, so they just stay there. And they're just taking space from your cluster. And if you're using that read concern that we mentioned above, your driver, if, if it's reading from the secondaries, will access those documents as well. And finally, one of the problems that you might face on uh, when you are on a sharded cluster, that's a very common one, is called unsharded collections, right? There are some restrictions around sharding, Jason mentioned them. So some collections might, you might not be able to shard because they might have two primary indexes um, because they might be very small. So you think it's not worth it. Um, so all these uncharted collections, they're gonna stay on what we call a primary um, database and primary shard, right? So they're gonna stick with one shard. And since you are started from one shard environment, right, on a replica set, and I assume you haven't created new databases after the migration, all these uncharted collections will hook to your initial shard. So if you run a MongoStat or if you have monitoring system, you'll see that potentially that shard takes more operations and obviously it occupies more space on this. So what you can do for those uncharted collections and potentially the databases? Um, the one solution is to shard them more, right? If you cannot do that, you can distribute them using a command which is called move primary. So when you run that move primary command, you say, I want this database to move from, shard, from the shard that actually ran the command to the shard that I'm defining on, uh, on the move primary command. So from A to B. Now, that is gonna move the uncharted collections only. It's not gonna move the sharded collections. And it's pretty similar of doing a Mongo dump and a Mongo restore. And during that operation, while this operation is running, there's no way to take a lock and guarantee the consistency. So you must take a write downtime. Else, until this command concludes and makes the transition, everything that your driver tries to write on those collections, it's gonna to go to the old primary. And since that's a Mongo dump method, you might miss some writes. And at the end of this process, it's a good idea to flash your Mongo S's. Uh, there is a command that's called flash router config. You have to run it in order to make sure that all the Mongo S's have the same configuration. And here we try to summarize everything that we discussed um, on this uh, presentation. Um, there are a couple of phases when you want to migrate from a the replica set to shuttle cluster. Uh, the first one is you have to wonder yourself why I want to migrate. And most probably you, you need to uh, arrange a proof of concept with your teams to see that if the sharded cluster is actually the solution or just I'm missing an index. And obviously you have to get ready that you're gonna dive in a more complex environment. We discuss about that. You need more components, there are restrictions, uh, but at the same time, I think you're gonna jump into a more performant environment. And then you have to prepare the most important steps is here, here are to build the extra infrastructure. Um, and I think the actions here is go to the development environment uh, first and do the actual migration there, get ready, get familiar, and then prepare and do uh, the same for the production. And when you execute, um, you have to get, I think the most important here is to get familiar with the rollback scenario. If something goes wrong, how are you gonna fast redeploy your old connection string and 
go back to your replica set. Uh, when it comes to sharding, here we, we talk a little bit about the profiling. Uh, that's most probably a separate presentation of how you're gonna choose the shard keys. I think the most important here is that if you pick a bad shard key in the fashion that's gonna break your driver, if you're still on a single shard, which is the case, this is what we said, do all the sharding first and then add shards. You can just change the connection string and point it back to your replica set. And then just, if you want, wipe the entire infrastructure, go back to your replica set and start fresh. If you want to delete the metadata, that, that's also acceptable. The best is to just delete that sharded infrastructure, the config server, the MongoS, and start off, create new shard keys. While you are on a single shard, there is absolutely no risk, only redeploy away. And in the end, we discuss a little bit about scale. How, obviously, if you, if you shard your collections, you want to add more shards to take advantage of the horizontal scaling. And we discuss a little bit uh, the considerations around the balancing and the uncharted collections. With that, we want to thank you we want to, uh, for attending. We want to thank Percona uh, for having us uh, here. And uh, we are open to questions, if there are any. Obviously, we are on Slack, so you can hit us anytime there. Thank you.